Hello class, we're going to talk now about specific attributes of God. We're going, to we're going to talk about God's greatness first. We're going to talk about God's greatness. And his greatness involves, first of all, his spirituality, God's spirituality. God is spirit. He is pure spirit. John 4, 24, Jesus says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God then is invisible. There is no way to make an image of God that is worthy of God because he has no physical form. And this is why God forbids the making of images in the Ten Commandments. God is invisible. God does not have limitations of a physical body. He, he cannot be circumscribed to a particular place. Uh, or a particular time. He does not have the limitations of a physical body. There are, however, in Scripture, anthropomorphic metaphors. In other words, they, the biblical writers, and this goes back to what Calvin was saying about God talking to us in baby talk. There are times when the biblical writers use analogies to uh, us to help us understand when they speak of God's power, they may speak of God's right hand or his arm or his hands. It's a way of anthropomorphically speaking of God's power. doesn't mean that God literally has these things, but it is a way, it is a, a, a metaphorical way of, of speaking of God. There are theophanies in the Old Testament where God a, appeared to people in the form of a physical being. But God's spirituality counters nature worship and idolatry. It, it reminds us that we are not to worship nature. We're not to worship created things. And we are not to make an idol of God. We're not to make an image of God and, and worship it. God is, is greater than anything we can imagine. And so J.I. Packer rightly observes that any image of God must necessarily detract from God's glory and therefore is unfitting of God. The Mormon concept then of God as having a body must be rejected on biblical grounds. And this is one of many reasons why the Mormon faith does not represent biblical Christianity. To the, the idea that God was once a man who evolved into deity and now lives in a physical body on a planet somewhere is repugnant to scripture. So that's God's spirituality. What about God's life? God's life. God is the essence and the origin of all life. And this brings us to the idea of God's aseity. God's aseity. Let me write this on the board here. You'll see it in the notes. But let me write it down. Make sure I spell it correctly. God's aseity. Uh, this speaks of God's self existence, his self existence. In, in Exodus 3 14, Moses says, who, who will I tell them sent me? And, and God says, Tell them, I am sent you. I am that I am. God simply is. God is self existent. Uh, he has no other source of being. He is self-existent. And so God's existence is eternal. When we look in Genesis chapter 1, we find that uh, there's no origin to God. God creates everything, but there's no beginning to God. We look in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's no point of beginning. There's only perpetual, eternal being. God is independent also of us. Acts 17, 25, Paul makes this point very clear. He tells the Athenians, God doesn't need temples and sacrifices and all the stuff that we do. God doesn't need all of that. It is rather we who need God. God is completely independent. And so God has a gratuitous relationship to creation. In other words, it is an act of grace that God has created anything at all. Here's what Erickson says. A proper understanding of this aspect of God's nature should free us from the idea that God needs us. God does not need us. God has chosen to use us 
to accomplish his purposes. And in that sense, he now needs us. He could, however, if he chose, have bypassed us. It is to our gain that he permits us to know and serve him, and it is our loss if we reject that opportunity. So that is God's life. Now what about God's personality? God's personality. God is personal. And when we say God is personal, we mean he is a self-conscious being possessing a will. In the words of Erickson, capable of feeling, choosing, and having a reciprocal relationship with other personal and social beings. So God is personal. God has a name. We see this repeatedly in Scripture. He says, I am is his name. He is God Almighty, and, and so on and so forth. God has a name. God is active in that he knows and communicates. God is active in that he knows and communicates. In Genesis 3, God is communicating with Adam and Eve and he's involved with them. So God is not just some nebulous uh, a cosmic mind out there. God is personal. And so what are the implications of God being a person? Our relationship with him is one of warmth and understanding. One of warmth and understanding. God is a giving and receiving person. He gives life. He receives praise. God is an end in himself. Who does God worship? God. John Piper makes this point very clear. There is no higher being. All things are for his glory. Millard Erickson says, God as a person is to be loved for who he is, not for what he can do for us. God is an end in himself. There is also the matter of God's infinity. God is not only without limits, but is incapable of being limited. With regard to space, uh, numerous passages, and you'll find these referenced in Erickson, speak of God's uh, immensity, uh, Erickson says it is improper to think of God as present in space at all. God fills all things and beyond. God is omnipresent. Erickson says nowhere in creation is God inaccessible. Uh, David says in Psalm 139, if I take the wings of the dawn, if, if I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, wherever I go, I can't get away from where God is. With regard to time, time does not apply to God. God always was, is, and will be. And God is aware of the sequential nature of events in history and knows all of them at once. God sees all of history. <clears throat> With regard to knowledge, God knows all things actual and possible, past, present, and future. Don't miss this. God knows all things actual and possible. Just as we can surmise what might have been if certain conditions had prevailed, God knows with certainty what would have been if conditions had been otherwise. With regard to God's power, God is able to do all things which are the proper objects of his power, is what Erickson says uh, a catechism for boys and girls, an old Baptist catechism says God is able to do all his holy will. And so questions, absurd questions like can God make a, a rock so big he can't move it are entirely irrelevant because they are absurd and, and have no place in theological discussion. With regard to God's power, we have uh, in the Bible the name El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. God is portrayed in Scripture as overcoming humanly insurmountable problems. God's power over nature is asserted throughout the Bible, whether it's the storm that, that claimed Jonah, which the text says God hurled the storm upon the sea, or whether it's Jesus calming the storm in the Gospels. God's power over nature is asserted throughout the Bible. God's power over the course of history is asserted 
Again, Paul in Acts chapter 17, speaking to the Athenians, talks about how God regulates the flow, the ebb and flow of history and the course of nations. God's power over individual human beings is also asserted. In Daniel 4, we have the account of Nebuchadnezzar. When he makes his great boast, God strikes him with insanity for a number of years. And at the end of his period of insanity, he comes to acknowledge that God does whatever he pleases in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And he says, no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And Romans 9, 17 and Acts 16, 14, these are, these are all passages that assert God's power over individual human beings. So what are some things God cannot do? Because there are certain things God cannot do. He cannot do things that are logically absurd, such as make a rock so big he cannot move it. He cannot change the past. The writer of Hebrews tells us he cannot fail to keep his promises and he cannot do moral evil. He cannot do moral evil. Why? Because these things are inappropriate to God's nature and God's, God behaves as all creatures do. God conducts himself according to his nature. But what about God's freedom then? God was under no compulsion to make any of the promises he has made to his creation. He acts according to the, ple the good pleasure of his will, as Paul says in Ephesians 1.11. <clears throat> Erickson says, God's decisions and actions are not determined by consideration of any factors outside himself. They are simply a matter of his own free choice. So this uh, brings us to the question of the nature of the will. The nature of the will in God, the nature of the will in us. How are we to understand this? The will is free in God, as in man, to act in accordance with the nature of the being. Don't miss this, because how you define free will determines uh, a great deal in the discussion of how free will works. Man and God, the, the person... is free to act in accordance with his nature. Or if we're talking about humans, his or her nature. <clears throat> if we're talking about humans, his or her nature. God, being absolutely holy and righteous, cannot will to do otherwise. The will is governed by the nature of the being and acts freely so long as it acts in accordance with that nature without direct coercion or duress. So uh, keep that in mind as we move forward in other discussions that, that are going to touch on the issue of free will. This will be our operating definition of free will in this course. So what about God's constancy? The question of whether or not God changes. The Bible teaches in multiple passages that God is unchanging. The classic texts for this are Malachi 3, 6 and James 1, 17. What does this mean? This means there is no quantitative change in God. God can neither increase nor decrease. It also means there is no qualitative change in God. His nature is constant. His nature doesn't change. God does not change his plans, his mind, or his actions. We're told this in Numbers 23, 19. What that means is that God is always faithful to his covenant. And for us, that means God is someone we can always trust and depend upon. So what do we do with passages that seem to affirm God's change of mind or repentance of some course of action? Well, some are anthropomorphisms or anthropopathisms. There are ways of expressing uh, things to us in human terms that could otherwise not be expressed. Some are stages in the execution of God's plan. And some are changes of orientation. <clears throat> 
Now, there is a danger here, the danger of building uh, the doctrine of God's immutability on Greek philosophical grounds uh, is a huge problem. And we do need to be careful of that. But the issue here is not that, the issue is God's dependability. Can we depend upon God? Can we trust God? Lamentations 3, 23, 22 and 23, and 1 John 1, 9 speak directly to this. We can and we must trust God to be faithful. And this, this all brings up the question of open theism, which we talked about when we were defining terms. So we want to uh, say a word uh, quickly about open theism. This is a movement that began, I suppose, in the late 1980s, came into full flower in the 1990s and early 2000s, and posed a significant challenge for evangelical believers and was widely and hotly debated uh, among theologians and scholars. What is the philosophical grounding of open theism? Well, the major premise is that God has given his sentient creatures the power of contra-causal free will. So they have a different definition of free will. They speak of free will as contra-causal. And what that means is, given any set of circumstances, A, where I had choices one, two, and three, there's no way to predict whether I would choose one, choose two, or choose three. All choices in this uh, framework, all choices are really quite random. All choices are, are quite unpredictable. And at any given point, I could have chosen other than I did uh, for no apparent reason. It's quite arbitrary how the will works in this model. The minor premise is that God knows all that is knowable. God knows all that is knowable. Now, that, that's important because there's a second minor premise, and it is this. The future free acts of sentient creatures are not knowable with absolute certainty, or they would not be truly free. And so the conclusion is God does not know with absolute certainty the future free choices and actions of sentient creatures. But this is a, this is a bit of question begging, the way they set this up. Uh, because the, the major premise includes the conclusion in it, really. And so it, it is a philosophical framework and construct built on an Arminian understanding of free will that takes that to its logical extreme, to its absurdity. And so, in, in a sense, you might think of open theism as the extreme end of Arminianism, just as uh, primitive Baptist hyper-Calvinism is the extreme end of Calvinism on the other end of the spectrum. And so you might think about it that way. So what are the biblical groundings for open theism according to the open theist? Well, they will argue that God is said to repent of certain actions. They will point to Genesis 6, 6 and 1 Samuel 15, 11. God is said to change his mind about certain things. And they'll point to Jonah 3, 10. God is said to be ignorant of certain things. Jeremiah 7, 31. And there is the assumption that man's uh, free will is completely unconditioned. Man's free will is completely unconditioned. So what are the responses to open theism? Well, first of all, God's foreknowledge serves as the basis for his very claim to deity. In Isaiah 45 through 49, that whole section of Isaiah, Bruce Ware rightly points out, God builds his case for being the only true God, but on the simple fact that he knows not just guesses, but knows what will happen in the future. The open theism hermeneutic rigorously applied would leave God ignorant not only of the future, but of the present and the past. If you look at, at how God talks about Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18, 21. And uh, so I'm going to skip over some specific texts. Uh, Erickson will cover those. But uh, the divine expectancy and predictive prophecy of Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, Deuteronomy 31, 16 through 21 are completely undermined by this concept of open theism. And God's wisdom in, in open theism is certainly called into question. 
Uh, there, there's no way to maintain a solid doctrine of God's wisdom in open theism. So the open theism hermeneutic rigorously applied would leave God ignorant of the present and the past. And this has an effect on the believer's confidence in God. Uh, it means that God is making it up as he goes just as much as we are. And uh, he certainly knows more than we do, but he doesn't know everything. And, and, and he can't be depended upon to get it right every time. Especially if you read John Sanders' book, The God Who Risks, God Makes Mistakes. So what do we do with a case study like Jonah? Well, God predicts Nineveh's destruction. God relents, spares the city. But Jonah affirms that he knew this would be the result of his preaching. This is what he knew would happen if he went there and preached. The conclusion then is that Jonah's message of destruction was intended by God to be the instrument that forestalled God's judgment by securing the repentance of the Ninevites. And so God didn't really change his mind. God simply used Jonah's preaching to affect what his ultimate goal really was all along. Open theism also challenges the problem, the, the issue of biblical inerrancy. Because as John Sanders admits in his book, The God Who Risked, uh, even right down to the garden, it was possible that Jesus would, act, would, would back out and not go to the cross in spite of all the Old Testament promises made that he would. And so this, this undercuts the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. Open theism also leaves us with a God not really worthy of our worship. He is a lesser God, and it robs us of confidence in prayer. How can we pray to God, believing with certainty that he will answer our prayers if God isn't sovereign over things? So open theism is not a workable, viable, biblical option for the evangelical believer.